A new report called for the decriminalization of cannabis, recognition that a popular habit is relatively harmless and that too many people are being criminalized, or a gateway to hard drugs and frightening medical problems. Good morning, I'm Samira Ahmed and welcome to Sunday Morning Live. This week, a major report by scientists and police calls for the decriminalization of cannabis. But with concerns over the health effects of super strong skunk and other hybrids, is it right to make life easier for cannabis smokers? With an aging population and an overstretched NHS, is it time to ration treatment for the elderly? And is it happening already? And is comedian Rowan Atkinson right to claim religious groups are part of what he calls the outrage industry, intimidating artists and comedians should we defend the right to offend? Even if it hurts people, even if it offends people, speech must be free. Well, a very warm welcome to my guests this week. Jermaine Greer is a feminist author, best known for The Female Eunuch, which was first published in 1970 and has never been out of print. Peter Hitchens is the author of The War We Never Fought, The British Establishment's Surrender to Drugs. He's a columnist for The Mail on Sunday and an ex-inhabitant of a totalitarian state. And James O'Brien is a radio presenter on London talk station LBC. Formerly, he was the showbiz editor at The Daily Express. And Anthea Turner has revealed him to be her secret crush. We want to know what you think. Call in now to challenge our guests. You can give your views on Twitter or by phone. Phone calls cost up to five pence a minute from most landlines. Calls from mobiles may cost considerably more. And texts will be charged at your standard message rate. It's one of the most hotly contested issues in this country. Should cannabis be decriminalised? While some people believe it's harmless, others see it as a dangerous gateway drug that can cause serious damage to physical and mental health. But after a six-year study, the UK Drugs Policy Commission has concluded decriminalisation is long overdue. This isn't the first call from some scientists for decriminalisation and a greater distinction to be made between some popular recreational drugs. Professor David Nutt lost his job three years ago as a Labour government drugs policy advisor after claiming that ecstasy was no more dangerous than horse riding. To those wanting to liberalise UK laws on drugs, his treatment symbolises what they see as politicians' obsession with being tough on drugs and crime in the face of scientific evidence. They point out that legal cigarettes, and especially alcohol, cause far more deaths and, in the case of drink, violent crime. The Home Office says 2 million people in the UK regularly use cannabis. 42,000 in England and Wales are sentenced each year for possession and 160,000 people are given warnings. The Commission argues that cannabis should be regarded as a moderately selfish personal choice, like gambling or eating junk food. Some regular users include people with long-term illnesses, such as multiple sclerosis, taking it for pain relief. They're unhappy that current law forces them to seek out drug dealers to buy what they regard as essential medication. But a number of doctors say it causes serious physical harm, including cancer, because of how cannabis is often smoked without a filter. A number of psychiatrists point to studies linking the drug with serious mental illness and in some cases dangerous and criminal behaviour, though critics dispute this supposed link. What about the claim that cannabis is a gateway drug which can lead users to experiment with harder substances such as cocaine and heroin? Opponents of liberalised drug laws say decriminalisation would normalise drug use. Is it ludicrous that we continue to arrest individuals, convict and sometimes jail them over private recreational choices? Or would decriminalisation send out a false and dangerous message that cannabis is safe and socially acceptable? So, Peter, should cannabis be, de be decriminalised? Well, that's the problem. It has been decriminalised for decades. It should be recriminalised because of the disastrous effects of decriminalising it. Well, that's the question for today's vote. Should cannabis be decriminalised? If you think it should, then text the word vote followed by yes. If you disagree, text vote followed by no. Our text number is 81771 and texts will be charged at your standard message rate. You can also vote online on our website. For full terms and conditions, visit bbc.co.uk slash Sunday Morning Live and we'll show how you voted at the end of the programme. 
Uh, I was just wondering, James, you're, you're a parent now, and you know, do you not think it would be a big deal if your teenage child were to come home and, and tell you that they were starting to smoke cannabis? Uh, only because it's illegal and, and because of the trouble they may get into with, with the law for that. It, 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 it strikes me that uh, the, the argument shouldn't even be carrying on now. You refer to a six-year study by an independent commission. You refer to the government's own advisor on drugs. And, and all of the scientific consensus, you'll always find a few lone voices, suggests that our position on this is, is borderline ludicrous. I mean, your personal experience is relevant, isn't it? Because you say you were expelled from school. I, I got sung right? out of school 20 years ago. And, and I can tell Peter that that experience was not sort of soft or unpleasant. It was a perfectly horrible experience that involved policemen and, and the most horrible element of it was my parents reaction because my parents belonged to a, to a similar mindset uh, the idea that I might as well have revealed myself as some sort of crack addict the fact that I'd been smoking a bit of weed to them was absolutely awful it criminalized me it criminalized a couple of my schoolmates and it was ludicrous when you consider what goes on quite legally all the time I'm reminded of MMR I, I didn't know you were going to bring my children into it but when we decided to give our children the MMR jab what we did was follow the scientific consensus. We didn't follow scaremongering journalists, often well-meaning but spectacularly ill-informed. And we certainly didn't hang upon the word of a lone maverick scientist desperately trying to draw attention to themselves for being at odds with the prevailing wisdom. So I would say the attitude to cannabis for a parent is similar to MMR when it comes to who you decide you're going is to Is there trust. a moral panic about it? Peter. Well, there ought to be a panic about it because of the very considerable dangers. The, the difficulty about cannabis is that there is no objective measure of mental illness. So it is very difficult to say that cannabis leads to mental illness. The correlation is extraordinary. <clears throat> and very eminent psychiatrists, such as Professor Sir Robin Murray at the Maudsley Hospital in London, are sure that the correlation is strong enough for us to take it very seriously indeed and can't likely be dismissed by anybody. Okay. And I, I want to get into the details of, of the, the, the health risks in a moment, but I just want to bring in Jermaine, because you're from the generation you know, that promoted the use of, of, of drugs, so-called soft drugs like cannabis, um, as being kind of something positive and beneficial. What's your position now on, on the idea? Because we are still having this debate about proper decriminalisation. Well, unfortunately, I'm drearily consistent. <laughs> I seldom change my mind about anything. And in 1968 or something, I wrote a piece for Oz magazine that was called Flip Top Legal Pot and saying that while the flower children were floating around dreaming of a time when cannabis would be decriminalised, that actually they hadn't figured out that what was going to happen next was that corporations were going to um, copyright the names of drugs, um, the different kinds of drugs, that they were going to give them back to us with additives and so on, and then they were going to cripple us with huge taxes. Is they were that going your to objection? exploit it exactly the way that they did uh, tobacco. And the, my biggest worry if a child of mine was, was smoking cannabis would be, as you would have seen in the clip, that most of the time there's more tobacco than cannabis yes. in the cigarette. <clears throat> and there are other ways of taking your cannabis. And I remember the old days when we used to take tincture and we used to eat cookies. I have a, a, a checkered career with cannabis because it gives me a mass reflex. I actually hate it uh, and can't use it. But people very close to me, members of my family, are habitual users. What I will say is that it doesn't seem to have done them any good. But you could say that about lots of other things. Um, the, the, the interesting thing yes. about the commission, that this six-year independent commission that's just been well, undertaken by everybody from a former chief of the constabulary <coughs> through to a professor of neuroscience at Oxford University, is that they address Jermaine's point directly. Uh, you, you're worried about the, the corporatisation of it, or you may be worried about the wrong people getting involved. It, it, one of the elements that has been ignored by the media is the criminalisation or the decriminalisation of growing a small amount yourself, which leads you to a sort of cottage garden approach to cannabis legislation, hang which, on, which flies on, in the yeah. face of a Peter. lot of the fear. I don't actually right. seem to be getting very much part in this discussion, and I think I probably know more, <laughs> rather more about it than, than particularly than James, and I would like a chance to save some of what I came here sure. to say. And first of all, the dangers of cannabis are considerable, and it would be very, very responsible of any parent to think that the tobacco was more dangerous. All you need to do is turn to the appalling experience of, of Patrick Coburn's son, Henry, described in a fantastic book called Henry's Demons. Uh, he, was, he was exposed to cannabis at his school, and as a result, he ended up in the locked ward of a mental hospital. It won't happen to everybody, but you don't know who it's going to happen to, and young people and people at school are particularly terribly vulnerable to it. Secondly, this argument about James saying he was criminalised. He wasn't criminalised. He criminalised himself 
by obtaining and, 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 and using a drug which he knew to be illegal. You, you're you're not, you're not, wait a minute, you've, you've, had, you've, had a very, you've had a very, you've had a very long you're say. Talking about me, you've people. had a very long say. I'm talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing this, <laughs> this, use, this use of the word <laughs> criminalized, we'll respond when your turn comes. Thank the you. use of the word criminalized is, is, a, is, is, a, is a tricky dodge to try and com complain there's some kind of persecution going on. Okay. The drug is illegal. Finally, this independent commission, of whom is it independent? Why is it a commission? It is a pressure group. Nobody sitting on that commission was conservative about morals or drugs at all. There was nobody, of my opinion, on it. It was a former chief of the constabulary. The, 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 police the, 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 the police in this country are one of the principal principal lobbies for decriminalisation. Right, so they're all wrong and this book you've read is right. Well, can I bring in well, a scientist it's, it's, here, put, put, put quite simply on this matter, they are dangerously wrong and if we continue down this path, we are, go, we, are, go, we, are, we are and your scientific qualifications are... I don't know. We are... Peter, Peter, I want to bring so, in, so, I want so to bring I. in a scientist okay. on this well, who I has something to I just cited Professor Robin Murray, whose work you've no doubt read. Peter, just a moment. Peter, just a moment. I want to bring in Professor David Nutt, who was the Labour government's drugs policy advisor and who famously, you know, fell out with and was sacked. Um, I want to mention, bring you in, Peter, and uh, Professor Nala, thank you for speaking to us, because you, know, you spoke out about what your views were on the scientific evidence. Now, I understand that you've said you think alcohol consumption might go down if we were to decriminalise cannabis. Can you, can you tell us what your view is now? Oh, unquestionably. I mean, uh, alcohol is the biggest problem we have in terms of uh, harms from drugs in the UK at present. It's the leading cause of death in men between 18 and 60. And the deaths from alcohol have been rising, rising inexorably in the last 40 years as we've increased the availability and effectively reduced the price. Can a, a lot of people would prefer to use cannabis rather than alcohol. Uh, and we now have evidence from the US today where the increasing availability of medicinal cannabis has led to a reduction in alcohol intake and the, it's a road traffic accident deaths from alcohol. Okay. So uh, we, Professor Nutt, sorry, I just want to also ask your opinion of what you've heard with this claim that scientists who, who call for decriminalisation are somehow biased. I mean, what's your view on, on what Peter in particular has been saying? No, we're not biased. We're the, the ACMD did three major reports on this over the last 10 years. We took evidence from people like me, and it's clear that the contribution of cannabis to history is at best a very minor contribution. A minor and in fact, many people, many people use, many schizophrenics use cannabis to help them deal with their illness in a beneficial way. All right. We'll I have to leave it there, Professor. I'm sorry we've had a few problems with the quality of the line, but thank you, Peter. Well, I mean, first of all, the, the professor actually said that the more alcohol was used, the more damage it does. Well, of course, and that it would be exactly the same. If cannabis were formally legalised and went on commercial sale in this country and were as prevalent as alcohol, we would have disastrous consequences. Nobody here is arguing that alcohol is good. How anyone could argue that because alcohol does immense harm, it would be sane or sensible or rational or, or scientific to, to, re, to relax the laws against another argue. dangerous point. Stop heckling. How you can possibly argue, and I will say this again because I'm sick of being heckled by this person, how you can possibly argue that the dangers of alcohol, which everybody recognises, are an argument for unleashing another legal poison in our society, I don't know. The fact right, that okay. Professor Nutt is qualified in neuropsychopharmacology does not make him a guru on the dangers of drugs in society. He's okay. an expert on neuropsychopharmacology, not on the dangers of cannabis. All right, let's get a response. James and then Jermaine. Matt, is that all right, Peter? <laughs> James, come Is what all right? That's, may, may James, I speak come now? on. Thank Any you. Like? Uh, Professor Nutt was not arguing that uh, the alcohol is somehow... a. Uh, a, a comparison that you drew, what he was arguing was that cannabis is, is less harmful and your position leads inexorably to legislating for alcohol by looking at people sleeping under bridges, existing on a diet of electric soup. The point is that the extreme examples you point to are neither representative nor indicative of the widespread use of something that is almost always 
harmless. And the, and the smoking element of it can be easily dealt with by a frank and open conversation. Right. It's extraordinary. Jimmy, just a moment, can, can, I, can I just respond to Very that? briefly, it's extraordinarily I want to irresponsible to refer... Finished. Well, because you stopped. James, please. It's, extra, it's extraordinary, it's extraordinary to, to, for, for any, any person to claim that cannabis is harmless. We do have objective evidence recently from the Dunedin study that among the young, cannabis actually can be shown to reduce intelligence. That, because we accept an objective measure of intelligence, that has been established beyond doubt. What if it reduces intelligence is it also doing to you? Would it be unlikely right. that a major mind-bending drug had effects on, on, on Let human Let me bring sanity? in Jermaine here briefly, then I want to bring in uh, another uh, contributor. The What's your view interesting what point about it being a gateway drug is you could argue that all drugs are gateway drugs. That if you have that approach to life, you're miserable, so take something and you might feel better, it encourages people to look for ways out of difficulty that are pharmacologic, that are... Okay. Uh, but because, for example, uh, methamphetamine is a very dangerous drug, and speaking in terms of the experience of my family, uh, even a short episode of use of methamphetamine has caused utter devastation. Mm. Uh, there really is a continuum okay. here. I want to bring in Gary Parker here, who runs the treatment program at Parkview Project Rehab Centre in Liverpool. Uh, you've heard the discussion. There are scientists on this uh, commission we keep talking about who've said taking cannabis is just like gambling or eating junk food. Wouldn't decriminalisation make your job easier? You wouldn't have to run maybe a project like this. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I don't know where... I'm not an advocate of the decriminalisation of drugs. Whether it would make my job easier is another matter. You know, I'm a frontline worker in the drug and alcohol field in Liverpool. And my experience is that this not only destroys individuals who habitually use See, the difference between what's on the streets today to 20, 30 years ago is the strains are a lot more powerful. And it not only destroys the individual who's smoking the skunk and the cannabis, it destroys the families. And how young are these people using it? Because you've talked about um, well, people I've, killing themselves as well. Yeah, I've worked, I've worked with kids from the age of nine up to 26. You know, I've worked with families uh, who's sons have uh, committed suicide through psychosis, paranoia. Uh, and you think there's a direct the link between the, the heavy cannabis yeah. use of, of potent strains? Yeah. All right, thank you very yeah, much, um, Gary. Sorry, I'm just conscious I wanted to bring another voice, but thank you so much for what you've told us. Uh, Clark French um, is um, someone who's used um, cannabis, I think, uh, for medical reasons. Is that right? Can you tell us why you take yeah. it? Um, I have a condition called multiple sclerosis and I, I use it to basically treat my symptoms. It gives me a much better quality of life in general. Um, cannabis has been known to have medicinal value for thousands and thousands of years. It's, been, it's one of the fun, 50 fundamental Chinese herbs. The Romans used it and grew lots of it in this very country. It's part of human history. It's part of our culture. It's ridiculous that I'm that I'm denied a medication that's been scientifically proven to work. Br that briefly, tell us what's your I, experience with experience of people like you in getting it, given that it is illegal. I mean, is is that the issue? Well, well no, that that's majorly part of the issue. But it, it's you know, I'm forced to deal with the black market. I'm forced to deal with criminal gangs who don't grow good medicine, who do it for profit. And what the the person was just saying, all these all these strains or whatever, all of that is a product of prohibition. They only exist because of prohibition, because okay. it's easier to sell a stronger stuff for more money, for profit. There's it's not it's not cannabis. It's prohibition that's created this cannabis. Clark, thank you so much, um, Peter. If if it was medically controlled in the way that in some states in the US it is, and, and, and it's only bought in certain circumstances by patients, would you have a problem with that form of leniency? Well, first of all, a, a lot of drugs have beneficial effects, but they also have side effects which are damaging. But just on no, wait a minute, thing. thalidomide was very good at treating morning sickness. Unfortunately, it had a side effect so devastating that this was not good enough to allow it to be, uh, to, to be, to be used. We got rid of it, and there's been a huge scandal about it. If, if a drug 
is, is seriously has a serious danger of making you mentally ill, then you're going to be careful about using it for anything. Okay, the other, no, 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 the, I just need, uh, I need the, to the, the, the medical the cannabis, medical issue. The medical cannabis argument was described by the chief campaigner for cannabis legalization in the United States, Keith Stroop, many years ago as a red herring to get pot a good name. Okay. It remains that. There are, however, and that gentleman should know it, there are, pr there are actually prescription, uh, prescription cannabis drugs based available on the NHS. medicines available no, on the NHS. That's true. Uh, James. Well, prohibition by definition breeds ignorance and, and enhanced corruption. Ignorance about what is available, igno ignorance about about side effects and and also uh, the, the worst sort of exploitation that we've heard of. Okay. I, I, I think oh, oh, citing very briefly. It, it, well, okay, in, in a medical sense, Queen Victoria used it for period pains, and that's an okay. era, Peter, that you clearly approve of. Um, Jermaine, final word to you on this, briefly. Well, I, I think it's, it's culturally very angry, as you can tell. Except it's culturally ineradicable. My mother grew cannabis because it made her popular with her lodgers. <laughs> I mean, Australia runs in its rather dopey way on cannabis. Uh, you can smoke cannabis or, and eat it and survive. OK, well, we'll have to leave it all there. Thank you all very much. Very briefly, a couple of your comments from home. Um, Kate says, alcohol's more of a gateway drug than cannabis. Peter, this war on cannabis is causing far more harm to our communities than it pre prevents. And Jane says, the hysteria about cannabis is crazy. I know people who've smoked it for decades with no ill effects all have good jobs. Once we don't know what their jobs are. No war on cannabis. We abandoned it in 1973. Okay, Peter, there is no you. such war. People should realise that. What we see now are the effects of decriminalisation. Well, it's our poll question today, and you can see it's one that is very much exercising um, all our panellists. Should cannab cannabis be decriminalised? If you think it should, text the word vote, followed by yes. If you think it shouldn't, text vote, followed by no. Our text number is 81771. Texts will be charged at your standard message rate, or you can vote online by going to our website, bbc.co.uk slash Sunday Morning Live. You have around 20 minutes before the poll closes. Now, stories of elderly patients apparently being denied treatment regularly make the headlines. And this week, a study by the Royal College of Surgeons and Age UK warned decisions on patient surgery must not be based on outdated assumptions of age and fitness. But with the NHS overstretched and facing major spending restrictions, do difficult choices need to be made in the face of an ageing population? Should doctors ration treatment for the elderly? This month, new anti-age discrimination laws came into force in the NHS. But when it comes to treating older patients, is it being ignored? New research by the Royal College of Surgeons and Age UK has found that treatment for prostate cancer and joint replacement surgery dropped sharply in the over 70s, even though they make up the majority of people with the conditions meriting surgery. They fear that a £20 billion NHS efficiency drive is dangerous to older people. The report says it's often wrongly perceived that it's less cost-effective to treat older patients. They argue that an individual's personal health should be the key factor, and a fit 80-year-old might benefit more from treatment than a very unhealthy person half their age. But in an age of austerity, and with one in four beds occupied by patients who are dying, some argue that it makes sense to focus resources and treatment on the young. There's been huge controversy over GPs being asked to identify the 1% of their patients expected to die each year and discuss end-of-life plans. Talking about death is something we still don't do well in this country. Campaigners for the rights of the elderly say they've paid into the system all their lives, but should they have every right to any available treatment, no matter what the financial cost? There are worries that rationing treatment devalues senior citizens and places a stigma on them, making them feel a burden to society and their families. Could it be a slippery slope to euthanasia? Or would allowing age to determine how doctors treat patients not only save money, but enable the elderly to have more choice and control over how they die? If you have a webcam, you can make your point on Skype or you can join the conversation on Twitter, phone, text or email. The details are all on the screen. And we're joined for this discussion by Richard D. North. Richard's the author of The Right Wing Guide to Nearly Everything and a fellow of the Social Affairs Unit Think Tank. Uh, so, Richard, should doctors be rationing treatment for the elderly? Sure. I mean, uh, rationing is inevitable in a world in which uh, resources are limited and uh, health treatments are limitless. And if you've got to choose between um, extending an old life or improving a young one, I guess it's pretty obvious that the young uh, make a good, good claim on us. But it's much more, more interesting than that. 
we've drifted into a situation in which torturing old people rather expensively has become You're pretty talking normal. You're about aggressive um, yeah. um, sort that, of medical that, interventions. Yes, that has, had become pretty normal uh, and not compassionate, not good, not a good death okay. for too many people. Uh, Germaine? I think the missing term in the discussion is the patient. Um, in many cases um, that I know of, uh, elderly patients have refused treatment, mm. but it wasn't really understood what they were doing because their protest in the clinical situation was not understood. I watched as somebody refused every drink she was given, and I kept saying, please drink. But she was trying to say mm. that she was fed up, she wanted it out of there, and that was one way to mm. do it. We've got to un understand something else as well. That I understand the question about investing in expensive treatments that will keep somebody in relative comfort for four or five years when the same amount of money spent on a younger person might give you 40 years. Uh, when you're talking about a national health service, you, that's what you have to deal with. Okay. Uh, but, but, but there should be another option, which is that the family of that person mm. can say, can we pay for this operation? Mm. Can we is raise the fair? funds? Is that the NHS, James? Well, that's, oddly, that's the word I thought was missing from the, from the question, was the word poor, because, of course, we're only really talking about rationing of health care for old people who can't afford to go privately, and that, that is fundamentally wrong. That puts mm. a price not just upon longevity but upon life itself. There will have to be prioritisation. Of course there will, but I think that should be taken by doctors on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, you hear about these cases where patients have found do not resuscitate on their terrifying, notes. Terrifying, terrifying. Um, you know, you're, you're I say, a relatively young person. Thank One you. might say you could say, well, it's a rational decision. Why would you give a hip replacement to an 85-year-old? Make more it, sense it if we've be, only got a certain number it, to it give. It may well be rational, but it needs to be transparent. And, and you can certainly introduce choice. I think the case for, for I I easing people's uh, shuffling off this mortal coil is becoming increasingly mm. irresistible without having to decamp to the Dignitas clinic in Switzerland but it has to be transparent and it has to be free choice and if I was older if I was watching this program watching this debate listening to these proposals hearing this grim sense of inevitability I would be terrified at, at a time in my life when I'm probably not at my most robust and but fighting fit anyway the idea that I'm going to lose mm. my right to life because I'm old is, is, is Richard, in the extreme. That. well yeah. this week there was a controversy about about uh, the care pathway. Now, I know from conversations with people and who just look to explain, up, this is where this is when people are being advised that they're approaching the end of life and to have a th and to think about, about planning their end. Well, it's that, but it's, but it's, a, but it's everybody trying to work out better ways of, uh, if you like, systematizing. It's awful and it risks being tick box. But I think it precisely is trying to avoid that. It's saying let there be a fuller, richer conversation between more people about the end of life um, and I, I think old people themselves probably ought to be thinking about it more carefully I think their children who often fight aggressively for more treatment without thinking through what that really means ought to be thinking about the doctors obviously it's a pity in a way that the, the, there isn't the kind of priest element around now well, that's but, interesting. but we're having to organize in this in a new conversation and, I, and I'm very grateful and glad that it's happening right I'd want to bring in a professor Carol Sakura who's a professor of cancer medicine at the Hammersmith Hospital. Sometimes people worry that there's this attempt to just put everything together. Old people who are clearly, you know, nearing the end of life and people who just happen to be older who are, they feel, getting second-class treatment for things like cancer. Um, what's your view on how far doctors are responsibly and ethically treating older patients? Right. I think Richard is, is really spot on. Uh, we can't do everything, and it's not just the NHS, it's every healthcare system in the world, so it's nothing to do with politics. Private insurers are struggling as well, so it's nothing to do with public-private uh, balance. I think the difficulty is the scale of things. I've got a drug for cancer, a rare type of cancer that costs £28,000 a shot. Do I give it to a 93-year-old lady that's got profound dementia in a care home? I think most of us would say no. It would keep but are you really having to to make a choice like that. You're not being asked to choose between two patients, are you? And not between two patients, but you have a budget. And a budget means you have to make choices. Now, I really agree that it's not just age that matters, it's everything else that goes with it. And doctors have always used multiple factors for coming to decisions. Do you accept that so there are I cases of some doctors who have perhaps made an error when you see these cases in the papers? 
Do you think sometimes doctors think have been too arrogant and sweeping in their decisions? I think the difficulty is they've been poor at communicating things with patients. The whole not to be resuscitated business, do not resuscitate, is a poor communication. It's nothing to do with judging life and death. Most resuscitations completely fail, however old the patient right, is, wherever they're dying in the hospital on the street. Jermaine, it's just lack of communication when you put do not resuscitate on someone's notes. Well, I think it's a bit more than that because doctors take too much upon themselves. They want to make decisions that they don't have to live with. You have to also consult the people who live with those decisions. The first one of those is the patient. Now, people think patients can't understand risk, they can't understand cost-benefit, but they can. But they find it difficult to do it in the clinical situation. They get bad news, they're flustered, they're trying to factor it into a million things. They need time to think and work it out. And they also, they need information, good information. We know they're going on the internet and getting bad information. Okay. I keep begging the doctors I know, and I know plenty, to actually think about giving the patient a CD-ROM and saying, interrogate this when you okay. feel able to, and when there's somebody with you who mm -hmm. will steady you as you okay. pick your way through the options, I'll because the options are so many. Well, I want to bring in Michelle Halligan here. Um, your father um, had bladder cancer when he was 78, and I understand that one consultant was very keen that he shouldn't be getting surgery. What happened? What was the fight that you had, and what's been his outcome? Um, he was diagnosed in September 2008. Um, over a period of weeks, he had various tests and investigations, which uh, resulted in us being told he had a very large, aggressive bladder cancer. From the word go, my first reaction was to the consultant, are we going to take his bladder out? To which he told me, he's 78, it's not appropriate surgery. As time went on, and with each consultation, I continued to ask this consultant, um, are you going to take his bladder out? Um, he became increasingly irritated with me, told me there was a very high mortality and morbidity, it was major, major surgery. My father had no other disease process apart from a large malignancy, he didn't even have high blood pressure. So what is, happened in the end? You got a second opinion, is that right? We got a second opinion, we went 100 miles away, the consultant there gave him nine weeks chemotherapy, had his bladder removed and that was four years ago. And how is he doing? He's fantastic, he was rowing in a veteran eight on the river the other day, he's in the gym, he has holidays aboard, his quality of life is extremely good. And when they talk about denying patients surgery or chemo, if my father had not had that surgery, the cost implications for the NHS would have maybe been five times as great because he would have had to have a palliative care team, sure. painkillers, etc. So I think you have to be very careful when you talk Michelle. about denying patients surgery. Thank you so much. If, uh, just can I ask briefly, if Professor Sakor is still there, what do you say to Michelle? Um, that's the kind of human story that worries people. I know, and the doctor was wrong, clearly. I mean, Michelle proves it, but time has proven it. Uh, I think, you know, communication is the key and making a balanced decision. Doctors aren't the enemy. They're not really trying to do older people down, but it's getting a sense of balance, okay, and that's the trick. Thank you very much. Joe Richards. Yeah, I don't think the doctor necessarily was wrong, but that's a very tough conversation. Really? But, 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 and apples and pears are complicated. I can cite a good case of an old man who was told by his doctor, I can get you through this next thing with an operation. And the old boy said, yes, I'll go for it. He wanted to say yes to doctors, and the doctors wanted to keep going. And it was all charming in its way, except the old boy actually rather regretted being alive but for the next five years. Aren't these personal choices? Um, this James. is all proof of the, of the case by case position surely Richard because what you have inevitably when the word ration appears which it has in the question is the imposition of a threshold cross that threshold and you no longer qualify for this treatment and that is uh, that's cruel and unusual you, you, you have to look at the specific mean, circumstances. There's one thing I'd like to say about this and that is that the patient himself in this case he would be the same age as I am now uh, knew that it was going to be a painful operation, it was going to be risky, it was going to be hard to live with the sequelae, knew that the um, cytotoxics would make him feel awful, and that there was a risk of dying. And he went for it. He and made that, that choice. is the issue. Okay. Not all the rest. It's nobody else's decision but the patient's. Mm. I want to if briefly... the patient is demented, that's mm. a different problem. Thank you. I want to bring in Nick Bosenkett uh, briefly, Professor of Health Policy at Imperial College. Do you see the concern that uh, contributors uh, like Michelle have? And do you think there is a big difference between end-of-life planning and just turning down over 75s for surgery because you'd like to save your budget? Well, I'd like to stress what, what, what the, the actual position is, which is that uh, 20 years ago there was a lot of denial of treatment. 
there's now a lot more treatment for people uh, people in their 80s on dialysis and, and all kinds of other things. What we're not doing is offering privacy, dignity and control in the last phase of life. We're at a stage where there's a lot of over-treatment, over-prescribing and over-admission to hospitals which damages the well-being, quality of life for quite a lot of elderly people. We've got to face up to the need for better palliative care, end-of-life care. And a recent uh, study from uh, Boston has in fact shown that you can prolong life for longer than you can for using uh, chemotherapy in, in, in many cases of people with lung cancer. All right. Professor, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you. Um, I mean, Richard, have you rethought your view at all? You know, given that individual stories are really what it boils down to, and you can't make sweeping decisions for everyone. Can I'm you? afraid I don't think it is just individual stories. I, I, I think there is a, a matter of we, none of us get out of this alive. Doctors will make mistakes. Individual cases will go, go sour. Some will come right for the worst possible reasons. It's, it's a mess. It, end of life is going to be a mess. But, uh, but I think we are going to get, we are okay. getting better and better. I think our conversation yeah. about this is better. And I hope when it comes to me, I hope I will be in a, in a, in a better okay. surrounded by good help right. and, and better able to appreciate right. it. We have to leave it there, but a couple of comments. Martin, what kind of society have we become putting money before people? Uh, Med says if we're to ration any treatment on the NHS, it should be for obesity, smokers and the drunks, not the elderly. Thank you all very much. Coming up, is legitimate satire and public protest being curbed by a fear of causing insult? Or is it right to want to avoid offence? You can join in by webcam or make your views known by phone, email or online. Remember, keep voting too in our poll. The question, should cannabis be decriminalised? If you think it should, text the word vote followed by yes. If you think it shouldn't, text vote followed by no. Our text number is 81771 and texts will be charged at your standard message rate. You have about five minutes before the poll closes or you can vote online by visiting our website. It's time for our Moral Moments of the Week, and each of our panellists has chosen a story to reflect on. Uh, Jermaine, you've chosen this, the revelation that the England football team apparently takes sleeping pills to bring them down off the caffeine pills that they've been taking for matches. How shocking is that? I mean, these are athletes, they're supremely healthy and strong, and in order to make sure that they play to the top of their ability, we make them take caffeine, uh, which is only not prescribed as a performance-enhancing drug, because it's so prevalent in dietary things like tea and coffee. Mm. So they can legally take their caffeine, and then in order to get them to, get, to come down from their caffeine, we give them, I imagine, barbiturates or something. Well, and I, so I mean, what happened with it's the, the idea that they were taking, they were taking yes. sleeping pills, and when the match got postponed in Poland, um, none of them could sleep, which is how it emerged. Yeah, they were all on phone and things. They were wired on, on, pro, on, on, on caffeine tablets, which is why they played so badly the following day. They but I thought they'd night. given them the sleeping tablets, yeah. and they were too sleepy to get out of their own your, way. Your concern is that the that the athletes expect to just take these, these chemical uppers and downers all the time as part of their function. Look, the, um, I, have, I have a prejudice against medication and drugs generally. I, it, I think there's usually as much uh, in the way of undesirable effect as there is in the way of desirable effect. It almost, it doesn't matter really what it is. Um, and we're getting more and more into the way of thinking that all you need to do to deal with life is to change your body chemistry by eating something or sticking something in your body okay. or smoking something. And I think it's, it's uh, that's your slippery slope. OK. I want to move on to your choice, uh, Richard. George Osborne's um, interesting ticket um, situation. Um, the, the first class ticket that he had to buy. Mm. Um, was, I don't know what, what we can quite call it, mm. but it, it's a w been a weird week for the government with this ticket apparent gate. obsession about class, literally first class yeah. on the train or not. And then, of course, yes. uh, Andrew Mitchell and what he said to that police officer. It, it, it strikes me as very odd uh, that we've got a, a, a millionaire, Tory, Chancellor of the Exchequer of one of the richest countries on earth. It seems to me that for as long as there is a first-class carriage left, he is the prime candidate to live in it, or be in it, quite naturally. And, and was it just it, about how he handled the paying? Couldn't he have just bought himself an you know, upgrade I and know, paid for it I himself? I know nothing of how he handled that. I do know that we're in an absurd moment when uh, the, the knobs are calling... 
the plebs, plebs, and the plebs are calling everybody posh, out of touch. It, the, I mean, uh, the, uh, the Andrew Mitchell thing, I rather sympathize with people who reach into atavistic, old-fashioned language from their class background when they're angry. See, that's all we right. all We all do it. And I think do you? We, do everybody you does it. If you lose your rag, awful stuff comes out. That's just, that's just life wherever you come from. And we should all grow up about it and accept that it happens. What about happens. The, the broader picture of this? Well, is it, is, are we in a kind of class war? Or is it just whipped up by the media? Well, I th the narrative of austerity is very simply, uh, either one agrees with the notion of people who bear no responsibility whatsoever for the economic crisis bearing the brunt of the burden, or one doesn't. So the whole pleb... Uh, plays, the whole pleb issue plays into the notion that this government, whether you agree with this position or not, this is the narrative, this government holds ordinary working people who A, pay their tax, B, expect a certain degree of protection in the workplace, uh, and C, quotes, know their place, to, to pick up the bill for the excesses of okay. the bankers. But we and know if you nothing call them of what right. they I want to get in uh, James's choice point. as well. Um, you've chosen the story of the scout who's an atheist, the 11-year-old schoolboy, and who's been told he can't remain a scout because he won't take the oath of allegiance to God. Yes, it's a terrible story, this. He's 11 years old and, and, and not allowed... I mean, the, there's two elements of it that I think bear a little closer scrutiny. The first was his... First contribution was not about the ontological question or faith or religious discrimination. The lad said, I've never been caving before, and, and they're all going caving it's next week. It's surprising weekend. in a way, because, of course, girls can be scouts now, you can be different yes, religions, but, be but the religious thing... You well, he refused to do the oath, so I, I don't know if this will sort of consign me to the seventh circle of hell, but he could have done dib, 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 and the oath with his right hand and then just crossed his fingers. We all just used cheerfully to lie without well, even exactly, thinking exactly, that it was a lie. Richard, it never it. occurred it's, to us. That, I'm pretty sure that, that, that Scout that, HQ know, will he, override Should this. he have just taken the thing? Was it I'm important so that he stood up for his yes. <laughs> I'm proud of him. Yes. And if he wants to start his own scout troop, I might even scrape about and find a few quid oh. to send his way. <laughs> we brave, want Jermaine in a toggle. little boy. How extraordinary. And the other thing is that... Atheism is a moral position, mm. and he should be allowed to okay. hold it. One of the things that's irritating about our current society is if you call yourself a religion, it doesn't matter how ridiculous you are, you get special consideration, you're a charity, <laughs> you're tax-free, you're this, you're that. And if you're an atheist, you're on your own. Right. Good well, little boy. Good for <laughs> you. Well, I think this may come into our next discussion, but thank you all very much. Now, you at home may have been voting in. Our poll this morning, should cannabis be decriminalised? The poll is closing now, so don't text as your vote won't count, but you may still be charged. And the online vote is now closing as well. We'll bring you the result at the end of the show. The comedian Rowan Atkinson is backing a campaign to drop Section 5 of the Public Order Act, which he says is being used to intimidate artists, comedians and legitimate protest. Those arrested under the act include, over the years, a student on a demo who told a policeman his horse was gay, protesters who said a fundamentalist Muslim group were anti-gay and anti-female, and also a 16-year-old protester whose placard described Scientology as a dangerous cult. Jermaine Greer thinks it's important to stand up for the right to offend. This is her Sunday stand. Whether it hurts people or offends people, speech must be free. The common law offences of blasphemy and blasphemous libel were abolished in 2008. So it's really curious that under Section 5 of the Public Order Act, words or actions likely to cause offence are illegal. If the police see you giving someone two fingers, they could arrest you. You can't say or do anything that might upset people, even if nobody is actually upset. It's illegal to take the mickey. You can't call a spade a spade, because the spade's feelings might be hurt. Obviously, Section 5 of the Public Order Act 1986 is asinine. The great and the good, who are after all the people most likely to be lampooned and derided, have joined forces to get it repealed. Just because some people are terribly touchy, doesn't mean that the rest of us should be walking on eggshells. The grander the dignitary, the more he needs to be reduced to size if we are to remind him of who's really boss. So we show prime ministers, 
with condoms drawn over their heads or wearing their underpants outside their trousers. Everyone can do a parody of the Prince of Wales. I'm sure it hurts his feelings, but he just has to get used to it. Satire, lampoon, caricature, derision, all are essential for our political health. And while we're about it, we should repeal the civil law of libel that prevents us from telling the truth about child abusers until they're dead. Speech has got to be free. We have a moral duty to bear true witness. You can join in by webcam or make your point by phone, text, email or online. Peter Hitchens is back for this discussion and joining us as well is Tim Stanley. Tim is a historian who blogs for the Daily Telegraph and he's a big fan of Doctor Who, who he says is a classic British example of the Tory anarchist. We'll discuss that in detail another time. Um, Tim, you are a big fan of America, you know a lot about American history and the First Amendment is always held up as this great idea of total free speech. Presumably you're in favour of it. Well, we don't live in America, of course, and every country has to arrange itself according to its own history and traditions. But what I would say uh, when it comes to freedom of speech about criticising people is if you're dealing with civil society, not only is it okay to pillory the police, doctors, tax people, politicians, they've probably also got it coming. They're individuals, they're human beings, and they're part of an authoritarian superstructure that I think it's quite right to critique. When it comes to God, I would make a plea for self-censorship on two grounds. First of all, in the age of a war on terror, if you slander the Prophet Muhammad, you don't just put yourself at risk, you potentially put the people around you at risk. And we saw that happen in the Middle East recently with the uh, video about Muhammad. Secondly, if you're dealing with religion, you're really dealing with a foundational issue that goes to the heart of why people are what they are and how they live their lives. We just discussed in the last debate old people at the most vulnerable when they are dying. If you slander God, you take away their hope of a future life. You take away their sense of the sacred and you undermine well, their Well, assuming that they life. believe in God. I mean, that, that's a bit sweeping. But of it's course, interesting you make a distinction on religion. I'm just struck, Peter, as a, as a church-going Anglican. You must be sick and tired of in this country of, of all the kind of pillaring of, of Christianity in particular. Oh, Would you agree with Tim well, on this? You, obviously, you don't like it or particularly enjoy it, but I think it's something you have to expect. It, in the end, a, a religious opinion is the same as a political opinion. You choose to have it. If other people disagree with yours, they're entitled to say so. And I have to say that the existence of any kind of blasphemy laws in this country is often used in such countries as Pakistan as a pretext for maintaining laws against blasphemy there, which operate in a very, very savage and draconian fashion against Christians. And I think if we got, got rid of all kinds of laws of this kind here, it would make it much harder for them to be maintained elsewhere. In general, I think if you hold an opinion, you must expect other people to disagree Not even with the self -censorship and indeed, and indeed mock you for having it. argument that Tim makes, which is, you know, it's thinking about other people's safety, maybe. I mean, in America, for example, people don't make jokes about Christianity. They don't really need, no. you know, go there because they know most people are religious. No, I'm all in favour of good manners. The more good manners we have, the better. And I think one of the reasons for the problems we have at the moment is that so few people are interested in good manners that there are growing calls for them to be replaced by laws. But I, actually, much, much better for us to rediscover our manners and to make laws. But, Peter, don't you suspect that some of the best things in life particularly when it comes to culture, are rather vulnerable. And if you allow, but as God we have allowed... But God is not vulnerable. Jimmy. Sorry, that's the definition of God. He's omnipotent. Vulnerable, he ain't. Yes, but we're not talking about... Uh, God isn't going to be... He may well be offended, but he's not going to be reduced by Rowan Atkinson making a joke about him. But people's faith might be. Oh, not at all. I mean, Christ was derided and that didn't reduce people's faith in him. Uh, Do you think we used to be very funny then? about religion, though, and it's true that we're not as funny now as we were. And why is it, that? Do you well, think there is an outrage industry as Rowan Atkinson Oh, claims? there definitely is, and it's fomented by newspapers who love to make an issue of a trifle, as I think is the case in the current Tory difficulties. There's a lot of fuss about nothing. Uh, but I'm remembering Beyond the Fringe, and one of the funniest items in it was a typical Church of England sermon which was drivel from beginning to end and absolutely convincing. It was hysterical. And it would have done the clergy watching it nothing but good 
telling them they have to try a little bit harder. But it didn't do them any good. That satire, that explosion of unbelief... Why do you think it does no good? Satire is meant to well, Because the church isn't stronger for having gone through that process of being critiqued. It's not like uh, religious people take this on the chin and think, well, thank you for telling me my beliefs are rubbish and that God doesn't exist. Having heard that, I'm, I'm, I'm more strengthened. Well, That's hang on, not that how isn't, culture works. That isn't Shame. what the mock sermon did, by the way. And you can tell people that their beliefs are rubbish till you're blue in the face. It won't make them give up their beliefs. I mean, after 2,000 I mean, years of persecution, the Catholic Church is proof. Christians are told in the Gospels anyway they're going to be reviled for what they believe. It's something you, 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 sh you should expect in general. I don't think it weakens belief at all. Well, it's, it's in, like indifference The life of Brian, right? which you know there was a huge outcry about at the time. I wonder if a film like that would get made today. Um, but you would presumably stand up very much for the right of a film like that to well, have been I, made. Well, I, I wouldn't stand up for it. I, I, I think it's a horrible film, but I, I think that it, 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 it's futile trying to call for it to be banned. Uh, I, I, I dislike the people who, who, uh, who, who made it. I dislike the message that it carries. But I have to learn to, to, to answer back and, and defend my faith. There's another thing kind of about thing. that film. You can't understand it if you haven't read the Bible. Right. And also, it's not a directly attacking Christ. It's attacking Messiah cults. It's not directly attacking Christ. Whereas something like uh, Jerry Springer, the opera, I think is... Directly well, I think there's a lot of dispute about that. Um, I, I, I think that's... that's if we could go to the individual items, I think there's huge disagreement about that, and the BBC chose to broadcast it because they didn't believe that it did. I want to bring in Peter Tatchell here because um, you are well known for protesting on human rights issues. Uh, you're also, of course, a very big campaigner on minority rights. Can you tell us the circumstances under which you came to be arrested under this Section 5 of the Public Order Act? Well, it was some years ago. Um, I was part of a protest against the Islamist fundamentalist group Hizbrut Tahir, which had expressed extreme prejudice against Jews and Hindus and actually advocated, or some of its members had advocated, the killing of gay people and women who have sex outside of marriage. Um, we went to a mass rally, just the six of us went to a rally uh, held by 6,000 of their members and supporters and simply held up placards stating what they'd said and criticizing it. And for that, uh, we were arrested. Um, now, I find that really, really shocking that the police thought that um, uh, what we were saying, by merely repeating their horrendous, vile um, prejudices and incitements to murder, that we were the ones who were criminals. They didn't arrest the, 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 the Islamist extremists, they arrested us. Uh, Pete, uh, Tim, how do you answer? This is the big concern. People think there's huge political correctness around Islam, and you end up arresting protesters. I am not making a case for any legal censorship. I wouldn't do that. What I would make a case for, what I'm pleading for here, is greater self-censorship. Okay, should Peter not have turned up, though, with these placards because some people got offended? No, no, that's not necessarily the case because I'm not making the case for legal censorship. He may, he, in that case, that's actually rather brave because he is genuinely... Okay, okay, Peter Tatchell is a campaigner and an activist. I have great respect for him. Rowan Atkinson is a vaudeville act. He's a comedian. He's not Socrates. He's just making gags in order to offend, in order to make money off it. I think there's something very, very different between those two different debates. And we, you think we there's an irrespons irresponsibility question, then? It, that that is irresponsible. What Peter's doing is fighting for human rights, and I don't want to appear to be criti criti uh, critiquing that. I'm just saying that we need to be more polite and mannered about the way we deal with it. Just each before other. you come in, Peter, I want to bring in Simon Woolley from Operation Black Vote. Um, now, freedom of speech, you know, you've heard our discussion. It's something we all cherish. You think there might need to be some restrictions on what can be said. Can you, can you tell me your view? Yes, I don't think this uh, should be overly complicated. I mean, we can pretty much say uh, what we love, but there are consequences. And so if you incite uh, violence, then you may go to prison. Uh, if uh, you seek to be rude in the workplace, you may be fired. And as comedians, uh, yes, if you seek to offend by telling racist or, or homophobic jokes, then don't be offended if you are described as a racist or homophobic comedian. Well, it's interesting that... It's not that, overly complicated. I mean, you know, the, the N-word, for example, the, you know, the racial word, that, is that something you think is effectively taboo and, and it's right if people are arrested for using that in, in, in humour in the public sphere? Well, I, again, I, I guess I would call for self-censorship. But, you know, we, what we have to understand is, is that often uh, when that term is used, it's often followed by a punch in the nose. Thank you. Um, I want to bring in Josh Howie, who's a comedian and a practicing Jew. I understand you've told jokes about the Holocaust, but do you think there is a difference between being able to tell jokes about your own community, maybe to some extent within your own community, and making jokes about other groups, black people or Muslims? 
Sure. I mean, well, firstly, I mean, when I talked about the Holocaust in my set, it's um, it's about my experiences as a third generation Jew after the fact. It isn't. Um, sorry, I'm being very Jewish with my hands um, at the moment when Jew comes up. But um, it's not about denigrating the experience of the Holocaust sure. directly. Uh, in the same way that I do talk about black culture and about Muslims. And um, there is a difference, but I think I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't talk about all of those different subjects. And I've used the N-word on stage, but of course it's all about context and intent. And those things obviously just seem to get washed over when it covered on the tabloid or whatever uh it's what point you're trying to make and um and comedy can be used and comedy and it's, it's what jermaine was saying in her film um comedy serves a role in our culture what about the responsibility and, um, briefly you know the idea that sometimes it goes too far well, sure well, look, i have responsibility as a comic first of all to make people laugh that's the most important thing otherwise it's not comedy but i have responsibility to prod to provoke um, to challenge and to find where that line is. I think I know where that line is. Some people might disagree and okay. that's totally fine and then they're offended. But All I right. don't ever set out to offend anybody. Thank I you, Josh. To challenge and to make people laugh. Thank you so much, Tim. The point of comedy to make people laugh, I think comedy can also be cruel. It can also be a weapon. Let, let us not put it up as a, as a new taboo, something that we can't critique. We should be able to critique what co comedians say. I'm a fairly conservative person, but I'm a huge fan of political correctness because for me, it's a way of codifying good behavior and good manners. And at the same time as I think it's right that we're squeezing racist and sexist dialogue out of our society, I also have to say, as, if you're going to do that, you have to apply that to all groups. And as okay. a Roman Catholic, I'm sick of hearing that that priests are all paedophiles. As the son of evangelicals, I'm sick of hearing that evangelicals are all idiots, and I'd like the same standards of political correctness applied when it comes okay. to race I and gender. I want to bring in a Catholic voice very briefly, and then I will get the rest of the panel to respond. Dominic Burbage from Catholic Voices. Um, you've heard comedians saying it's just their job to satirise. Why do you think there should be any need to limit that? Yeah, so there's never... Um, no one is without limits um, in terms of speech, because speech is always a two-way process, right? So. On the one hand, you have a speaker, um, but on the other hand, you, you, have, you have a listener. So we can't champion comedians as having a kind of golden right to offend. Okay. Um, and, and what about your concern about marketing? Sorry, because we're running out of time. What's your concern about marketing, that you think actually there's a cynical ploy behind a lot of this outrage? Yeah, so a lot of insults uh, towards religious groups will be actually be employed as a marketing tool. So by creating controversy, the news does a lot of advertising okay. for you. And we've got to have a community response to that, not necessarily a legal right. response, but to say, I don't want to participate in that. All we right, thank you, Dominic. Um, Peter, isn't that, that enough? Of. You know, just the public react, and if they think something's gone too far, it sort of corrects itself. There's a very grave danger, though, which I want very quickly to address, because I, I hold opini briefly. opinions which are not consensus opinions, and quite often these days I get letters written to me where people say, you have insulted me by expressing an opinion. And I think there is a tendency increasingly to view the expression of a contrary opinion or a non-mainstream opinion as insulting, and that is very dangerous, especially given the wording of the Public Order Act of Thank 1986, you. which needs to be re reformed. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our contributors. Uh, we'll have a quick look at your text and online poll votes, which are in. We asked, should cannabis be decriminalised? Here's what you told us. 69% of you who voted said yes. 31% said no, um, it shouldn't. We only have time for a sentence each. Peter, you first. Well, I, 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 what can I say? It has already been decriminalised. It's okay. been disastrous. We should re-examine it soon. Tim. The only place I'd allow legalised marijuana is in airport departure lounges where I really need it. <laughs> you had a bad experience last <laughs> night, didn't you? Um, uh, Jermaine. The people have spoken. I think that's, that's the verdict. I don't share that verdict, as you know. But that should mean something to somebody out there. And, of course, there's a big question of whether either government, because you saw the Labour government as well being quite hard line on it, whether actually there genuinely is a desire to decriminalise. But thank you all very much. I'm sorry we can't reopen that whole issue. We appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who's taken part in today's discussion, to Jermaine Greer, to Peter Hitchens, to Tim Stanley, and to James O'Brien and to Richard Dean North, who were with us earlier. Don't text or call the phone lines anymore. They are now closed, but you can continue the conversation online. The links are all on our website. You might even be able to upload a film if you go and have a look. Do join us next week. Thank you so much for your company, and we look forward to seeing you next time.